Hi again, folks. This is your Serial Cynic. Um, checking in one more time, and this time, this video is a reply video. Like my last video, I think it was a reply video. And this video, I have to get out there because it's in reply to the various people that tell me I don't know the Bible. Now, whenever, and of course, um, just recently, I think it was David Levette was the name. Uh, he just mentioned this on my video about Deuteronomy chapter 28. And of course, it's a video where I was saying certain things about Hebrew Israelite theology. And of course, I'm sure that didn't go well with a lot of people based on the replies. But when people tell me I don't know the Bible, really, this is what they're really saying. You don't know the Bible, serial cynic. You don't know the Bible. Like, I want you to know the Bible. Or I would like you to know the Bible. Or, this is really what's behind it. You don't believe like I believe. You don't see things the way I see it. And because you don't see it the way that I see it, based on the Bible, then you don't really know the Bible. It's never the other way around, that they don't understand it. They tell me I don't understand it. Well, I have news for you. In case you have not watched my other videos, especially my videos on deconversion, which you can go back and take a look at, which would give you a better context of, as to where I am today. Let me just go ahead and just summarize. I am a former Christian. I threw that to the curb 15 years ago or whatever, somewhere around there. I was a deeply devoted, committed Christian. I'm not talking about the Christians you see on TV that um, go to church on Sundays, jump around, and that's it. No, I was deeply devoted. I used to go to, and of course, when you say Christian, that can mean so many things. It could be you're Presbyterian, you're Catholic, you're Anglican, you're Lutheran. But to be specific, I was a Christian and a part of a holiness type church. A holiness type church is generally rather strict. The things you can see Catholics and Lutherans and other church denominations getting away with, or these big, um, 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 big churches nowadays, I forgot what you call what the word is for them. These big gigantic churches you see nowadays where people can do all sorts of things and still consider themselves a Christian. That wasn't allowed where I went. I still went, I went to a church that still believed in a separation as a person, as a Christian, from the world. So in other words, even things like this, I was not allowed to wear. Jewelry was considered a way of the world. Our women could not wear jewelry, they could not wear pants, they could not wear makeup, they could not wear earrings. Um, in some cases, in some churches, some of our branches, they could not perm their hair or do anything like that at all. We couldn't go to movies because the world was there. We couldn't go to amusement park because worldly things were being done there. I couldn't go to things like dances and parties and so forth because those were world, worldly, worldly things. They were secular. They weren't of God. But what they also did was they emphasized heavily a literal interpretation and reading of the Bible. As a matter of fact, they were even against, in some cases, using modern translations. They preferred to stick with the King James Version because the modern translations, to them it looked like it was trying to get around certain things in the Bible that may, not, may have seemed odious may have not seemed acceptable. But I was a little bit different because even though they taught that, there were people in the church that basically just read a few Psalms every now and again to encourage themselves, a few Proverbs here and there, and some New Testament verses to make them feel good. Me? Cyril Cynic? No. I read from Genesis all the way to Revelation four times. And I don't mean I just read words in a paper. I had my lexicons, Hebrew lexicon, I had my concordances, I had my Bible dictionaries, I had like about six, seven, eight different Bibles, chain reference Bibles to refer and reference other verses to see what verses mean what and what it's connected to and so forth. I had a Schofield Bible that broke down the various dispensations and everything. I was really into the Bible. How much into the Bible was I? We used to have Bible quizzes in our church. I never lost one. Never. 
I used to know entire chapters in the Bible that I recited. I could tell you, and it's been so long now, but I could still tell you the books of the Bible in order. I think I can. It's been so long since I've even, well, really looked into a Bible. I used to know where you could find a verse, chapters. I was one of those type of people. I aspired to be that type because I truly believed that the Bible was written by God through men who were inspired to write it, I thought that everything in it was absolutely true, that there was no falsehood in there, there was no exaggerations, there were no embellishments. I believed it literally as I read it. Of course, as with everyone else, including Hebrew Israelites, there were parts that you read, and because you had preconceived notions about it already, well, you had a particular bias about it. Hebrew Israelites in this case believe that Deuteronomy chapter 28 is talking about us as black people today. And because they're already coming into it that people are telling them, hey, look, look at all this suffering. It's, it's almost like the Jehovah's Witnesses, basically. You're basically set up by saying, or already know, look at all the things that you've gone through. Look at all the struggles black people have gone through as a people collectively. Then it's like, hey, look at what the Bible says. Doesn't this match what we've gone through? Doesn't this match what we've gone through? And because of that belief that it matches what we've gone through, then it's going to look like, hey, this book looked like it predicted everything that's going on with us right now, so it must be true. But anyway... Getting back to what I said, when you talk about me not knowing the Bible, trust me when I say you don't know what you're talking about. I knew that Bible up and down all over the place. And it's so funny. It's not just Hebrew Israelites. There are people that I went to church with. There were people online. I remember years ago when I came out and said, hey, I can't believe this stuff anymore. That prior to that, they looked up to me to debate the unbelievers out there online. They looked at me and they were like, hey, they used to write me, hey, this guy out here is saying this about God and is saying this about the Bible. Can you go out there and go ahead and debate them and straighten them out? They used to call me like I was a cavalry to go ahead and deal with these things. And do you know that the minute I deconverted or turned away from the Christian faith, those same people all of a sudden now started telling me, you don't know the Bible. You don't understand. So one minute, I was all in. I understood the Bible. I knew the Bible. I understand what it was saying. I was believing like them. And the minute I turned around and stopped believing, all of a sudden, you don't understand the Bible. You don't know the Bible. You don't know God. It doesn't really bother me. But it's really an insult to my intelligence, and that's exactly what goes on here. Now, let me explain something to you that I found out and I learned along the way. Generally, people read the Bible in two ways. You have people that read the Bible in a vertical fashion. And what do I mean by that? I mean that they read it in a way where it's like... Um, they go ahead and they read it like a regular book. And that, and that regular book, it's written in a sense of, um, they look at it from page one to page 100 or whatever. Sorry about that, it was a little bit of distraction outside. Um, they read it in a vertical fashion, like a regular book. There's a beginning, there's a middle, plot, and there's an end. That's how they read the Bible. So they believe that there's a theme now, I'm not saying Hebrew Israelites, but this is how we used to be taught about it. We used to believe it. So they believe that there's a theme. So in the beginning, there's this, and then this happened, and then this is, what's gonna, this is how it's going to conclude, like a movie. But there are also people that read it in a different way, and this is how I read it to this very day, or I look at it, or I understand it. In academic circles... 
the Bible is read more horizontally. And what does that mean? It means that you don't look at the books as being a single thread of thought all the way through, even though to some extent you can look at it like that, like a movie, you know? But really what you're seeing in the Bible from an academic standpoint, it's like a topic. It's like, say you're watching, um, you're looking at um, a topic on, say, Rwanda and the genocide that happened out there. You had a movie known as Hotel Rwanda. You had a movie um, known as Sometimes in April, with, um, which was on HBO, which is Aegis Alba. The two movies have nothing to do with each other. On topic, yes, they do, but one is not a carryover of the other. You understand? They tell the story from different perspectives, so to speak. And at some point, facts overlap each other in both movies. But maybe that might be a bad example. It could just be, okay, say a movie about World War II. Tons of movies about those. But one movie may not be a continuation of another. It's this movie is this. Tells it from this point of view, from this character's point of view, from this whatever, whatever. There may be some thoughts of opinions or opinions in this particular movie. Then another movie comes out that talks about World War II, but it's from a perspective of this person, that person, different thoughts and opinions, and they may even contradict each other at times. Then you may have another movie that comes out, and then another movie. So you see how they go? They're horizontal to each other. I'm sorry, I have that completely wrong and backward, losing my trend of thought. I don't mean, um, when I said at the very beginning, I said people read it vertical and so forth. Forget all that, what I said before. What I meant is that people go ahead and they read the Bible horizontally. And those are the people who read it in a, in a, in a um, devotional sense. They're reading it for devotional purposes. So they read it horizontally. There's a beginning and of course there's all the way to the end. As opposed to vertically. I'm sorry about what I said before. Reading this book and treating it on its own merit, Genesis. Reading this book, Exodus, on its own merit. You know, and then so on down the line. That's how academics look at it. You look at a particular book in the Bible. You look at the conditions. You look at the environment in which it was most likely written. And you take that book for that book only. You don't go ahead and grab something from the book of Revelation and say, Hey, you see back here, this in the book of Leviticus is fulfilling something in the book of Revelation or vice versa. So when I look at the Bible at this juncture of my life, because it's a book that I still have some respect for, when I look at that book, I'm looking at it from a vertical standpoint. So if I read the book of Genesis, or if I read a chapter in the book of Genesis, I am reading that chapter in and of itself. It doesn't mean that it cannot be connected to other parts of the Bible, of course, but it just means that I'm going to go ahead and look at that book on its own merit. Because it may have been written at a particular time. It may have been writ written by a particular group. It might have been written by a particular person with their own biases and so forth. So, I am not going to pick up a Bible today and pick up the book of Romans and say, Oh, look at this verse over here. Oh, this is a fulfillment of something that was written back in the book of Numbers. No. And if I had to go, and I'm, that's going to be another video, I can go ahead and break down so many things in the Bible where there are contradictions, where there are conflicts, where there's evolution of thought in the Bible, where it went from one place to another, to another, to another. And one quick example I can give you, it's this. If you ask a Christian today how many gods there are, they will tell you that there's only one true God. I guess Hebrew Israelites will tell you the very same thing that other gods don't exist. But what if I take you back to the Old Testament and show you where there was a belief that other gods existed? Of course, I don't believe any gods exist. But in that mindset of those people in ancient times, they believed that other gods existed. The difference with the Hebrews or the Jews was that they believed that their God, their God, Yahweh, was the only God worthy of worship. They believed that that God was one amongst many, amongst many, but that they were sworn to allegiance to that one God. 
and they were not to pay attention to or serve the gods of other people. I can prove that easily, easily, easily. As a matter of fact, I think my first video that I did deals with this topic. And it goes to show you the evolution of thought. The thought was, and you can read it in some of the, you, in, um, in the Psalms of Moses, you can also read it in, in, in uh, Chronicles, I believe, or Kings, where Solomon gives off praises to, to God. And you can read it. It goes like this. This is basically the thought. The thought. Which of the gods in the heaven are like you, you, Yahweh? There's no other God in the heavens as great as you. And even the very first commandment, you should have no other gods but me, implies that there were other gods or implies there was a belief that there were other gods out there. But by the time you get to the latter Old Testament, by the time you get into the New Testament, by the time you get beyond the New Testament, it was a foregone conclusion that there's only one true God. So how do we go from a belief in many gods, but our God is reserved for our worship, and we're not supposed to mess with the other gods, to, hey, there's only one true God, and it's our God. That is what I mean by the evolution of the theological thought. So when people come to me and try to tell me I don't know the Bible or I don't know what I'm talking about or whatever, I understand the Bible within the context that it's written in. That's another thing you have to understand. People believe that the Bible is dropped out of heaven or God came and said, hey, write this down, Elijah. Write this down, Moses. And they just wrote. Because remember, a lot of the contents in the Bible was not written in real time. Clearly it wasn't. Who was around in the beginning? God created the heavens and the earth. Who was around for that? So someone had to sit down and, and the understanding is, well, you know what? Somebody didn't just pull that out of their ass. God told them and they just wrote it down accordingly. The fact is, a lot of the stuff that we see in the Old Testament especially were written long after the times that they detail. Some of it would have, would, of course, was probably handed down through oral tradition. But the Jews came to a point in their history where it was like, you know what, I think we need to write down our history, just like we do today. Where someone may get up, maybe through a DNA sample or whatever, that decides, you know what, I'm going to put a family tree together. And I'm going to go around and ask my elders and try to reconstruct our family history. That is essentially what happened with the Jews. So it was not written in real time. It was not this thing where God was sitting down. No, these were men, mere men who sat down and just started writing. Yeah, you know what? We're here in captivity in Babylon, and it sucks. I think this is a great time when we can go back and write our religious history. And they wrote their religious history filtered through their understanding of that God of theirs at that point in their history. And at that point in their history, they had gotten to a point where it's like, no, our God is the only God that's out there. Our God is the only true God. And they wrote their contents back in history, filtered through that belief. But even though you read it, it wasn't one person who sat down and wrote those books. You could see where various people or various interpretations bled through the text. And the whole point that I tried to make in one of my other videos is that when the Jews sat down, they were trying to explain up to the point of how they ended up in Babylonian exile. And why, that was the big question, why we ended up in Babylonian exile. And the bulk of that explanation was we forsook our God. We didn't do what we were supposed to do. So in retelling the story, they try to show where they screwed up along the way to end up in the position that they ended up in. That was the motivation. That was a driving force. And there were people who believed in the Yahweh cult, who believed that Yahweh was the true national God of Israel. Of course, we read through the Bible and a lot of Jews didn't go along with that belief. They were serving their own gods out in the hillsides and out in the rural areas. But there were people who want to bring these people to the understanding that the national God, 
the God of the monarchy, Yahweh, was the true God. And now these people in exile, desperate, dejected, depressed, hurt, and in shock, it was a great time to spring it on to them. Hey, look, we're in this position because we did not follow our national God. We didn't do what we were supposed to do. And so when these people sat down to retell the story, they go ahead and they tell you about Yahweh and how the people forsook him and did not do what they were supposed to do. And this is why they ended up in the situation that they ended up in. Hebrew Israelites today are doing something very similar. Thousands of years later, hey, we black folks are in this position because we're not following the ways in here. And if we just go ahead and follow the precepts and follow what the Bible says and follow what we tell you to follow and how to dress, how to eat, how to do all these things according to the Levitical um, practices and so forth. If you just follow these things right here, then we'll get back into God's good graces. I can say a whole lot more about this, but I'll stop right here. But this is exactly what I mean when people come to me and say, you don't understand the Bible, you don't get it, you don't know. No, you, what you're trying to tell me is I don't understand the Bible the way you want me to understand it. And because I'm not going along with your program, it's all of a sudden you don't understand the Bible. I can ask any of you, you want to challenge me? You can go ahead. I can bring up things in the Bible you are probably not even aware about. I can mention things to you to the Bible that you probably are not even, you're just like, I didn't know that was in there. Because that's the big thing that I have with a lot of Christians today that I debate. Not Hebrew Israelites, just Christians. I bring up things that they are not even aware is in their Bible. Because trust me, from my days back then up to this very day, a lot of Christians do not read their Bible. They don't. They don't know half of what's in there. They don't know some of the crazy things that are in there. Things that they're supposed to be following. That if they follow today in today's world, they'll be put in jail. But they don't follow it. They don't live up to it. And the way that they go ahead by explaining it, some of them, well, that was under the law. We're under grace now. So we don't do those things like stoning people to death and so forth for not believing in Yahweh. But they'll support that and tell you, well, yeah, you know, back then, that's the way it was. You know, these people disobeyed God and God said, stone this person to death and they did. But I wouldn't do it today. Why wouldn't you do it today? The Bible tells you to do it. So, I get a little ticked off when people tell me I don't know the Bible or whatever. Again, you're not telling me I don't know the Bible because you don't think I know the Bible. You're telling me I don't know the Bible because I don't believe it the way you want me to believe it. The way you want me to see it. So just think about that when you're coming in here saying stuff like that. Trust me, I understand. I understand the Hebrew Israelite position also. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to go ahead looking. It's, we're black folks. We're marginalized. Right? We lost our history. They washed it out. Separated us brought us onto the side of the world. We don't know who we are. And a lot of us are searching for identity to feel a part of something, to feel special about something. And one way to do it is, hey, look at this. There's a God. They say he's a God of the universe. And we're his little special snowflakes. Check it out. We're not unique when it comes to that. People have been doing this since the beginning of time. The Jews in the book of Hosea, it says, are the apple of God's eyes. The Babylonians felt the same way about their god, Marduk. The Greeks felt their way, that way about Zeus and so forth. You feel like you're your little god, special little snowflake. And you are specially called people and specially chosen people. That's us as humans. We want to feel like we're special. We want to feel like we're needed. We're wanted. We want to feel like we identify with something. So this is very appealing. Here's a black man walking around the place. You don't even know who your great, great, great grandfather is, at least on your African side. We're lost, walking around. We don't know who we are. And someone comes up to you and say, hey, the God of the universe is interested in you. And even if we're not even talking about color, it's the same thing with people. There are people walking around who just feel lost, aimless. And someone comes up to you and says, do you know God loves you? 
Do you know God wants the best for you? Do you know God has a plan for your life? That's what churches do. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do out there. Because people want to feel like, me? God loves me? He has a plan for my life? I mean, he cares if I find my car keys or if I get a job tomorrow? You mean to tell me he cares about if my fridge is full with food? God cares about me like that? He cares about my future? He cares about my children? The great God of the universe, the big genie out there who can make things happen, work miracles, that guy is interested in me? People want to feel like they're part of something. People want to feel like they're connected to something. And what about the big connection to the God of the heavens? Who doesn't want to feel that way? We are not unique as black folks. Hebrew Israelites, you're not talking about anything that's unique. In one of my videos, I also mentioned the fact that it was a point in history when white Europeans, the British, believed that they were God's chosen people, that they were part of one of the ten tribes, that they, would, they were um, Ephraim, and that white Americans was, were uh, Manasseh. And this is before modern-day Hebrew Israelites and black people. They believe that too. We're special. Look at our great empire. God must love us. And there were people that actually taught that in England, that we white folks are chosen of God. We're one of the ten tribes. And like anything else, they went to the Bible, just like Hebrew Israelites today, and they start picking up things and cherry picking and saying, see right here, it talks about us, and you see right there, it talks about us. You're not unique in what you're doing, Hebrew Israelites. This is an old game. It's just retold, just repackaged. I understand you're trying to find a sense of purpose and a sense of identity, especially for us as black folks. Now, what greater way than to go ahead and basically own the Bible as yours now? White people have been doing that for years. You feel now it's our turn. Nah, the Bible's not talking about them white people over there. It's talking about us black folks. And they stole this from us. And we're reclaiming it as ours. And now we feel special. I understand where you're coming from, but I'm not buying into it. I'll end it on that note, okay? This is a little disjointed all over the place. It was on the spot. Sorry about that. I'll try to see if I can do a better job the next time, okay? And I'm sure some of you are going to have a lot to say about this. Go right ahead. I appreciate it, okay? And I welcome it. You guys take it easy. Until the next time.